entered without me. Hello to everybody who now I can say officially hello and welcome. My name is Justine, Justine Friedman, and I am a clinical dietitian and a mindset mentor. I have been working in this field of nutrition for very, very many years now. I'll give my age away. I think I qualified at the end of 1999. And uh, only recently have I become a lot more invested in the women's health space, specifically in midlife. And uh, I'm going to introduce my wonderful guest, Jacqueline Rose, who I had the privilege of meeting probably about two years ago now. And last year, April, Jacqueline invited me to present, to be interviewed for her menopause summit which she has now presented for two years in a row. What an, yeah, what an incredible summit. So Jacqueline is a menopause educator and there is a whole list of everything that she does. She was originally a yoga teacher. In fact, I'm going to discuss with you a little bit about the yoga that I did with her a year ago. Uh, she's a hormo woman's hormonal health practitioner. She is trained in functional blood work analysis. She is a as well as a woman, a woman's yoga teacher, also a therapeutic yoga teacher. So, and another whole long list of so many things in her biography. Um, so thank you, Jacqueline, for joining me live tonight and for giving of your time. I really so appreciate you being here. Thank you for inviting me. And I will say to your audience that you were the only person that I invited back a second time to be a speaker in their second annual menopause um, summit, which really goes to show how much um, I love what you're doing, the message that you're giving out, the um, approach that you are taking to um, food, digestion, health, and we're gonna delve into all of that uh, today. Wonderful. So there's so much that I wanted to speak about and I have my list here so that I don't forget. But I thought I would just share a little bit of how I got into this journey and how Jacqueline was actually very instrumental in me even taking an interest in so much of women's health in, in midlife. So a little bit of background is that I was in perimenopause without realizing it. And only when I spoke to Jacqueline at her menopause summit last year as the expert in nutrition in this field, did I actually connect the dots for myself? So where was I finding myself completely battling was from about the age of 43. And there were a number of different triggers that happened at that time of my life, which I know Jacqueline, we're gonna speak a little bit more to your protocol and the triggers that you help women identify and work with in order to reduce symptoms of perimenopause and menopause. But for me, they seem to be in isolation until I finally was able to like have this aha moment of, oh my goodness, they not, they were all interconnected. So as a family, we made Aliyah at the end of November 2019. For those of you who, who don't know that lingo, that means that we Im immigrated from well, for us from South Africa to Israel. And that was exciting, but a huge stress and a huge change. The months leading up to it had been stressful, but I just powered through. Then I had to convert my degree to work in Israel. So I had to sit and study, which was also after 20 years of not having written an exam was on another level. And then Corona hit. And over this period of time, which was a six-month period from November 2019 until about Pesach, until Corona really was full force, I picked up nine kilograms. I was shock and horror. Here's this dietitian who should know how to eat, who should know what she's doing. Um, yes, I was eating emotionally. All the chocolate granola I could get my hands on. It was emotional. It was comfort eating. It was being out of my, my zone. But it did not feel fair that the amount of weight that I picked up was, was so much. And I thought, okay, it's stress, it's new food, fine. I had skin changes at the same time. I started getting eczema, which I had never, ever had before. And then slowly things started happening. I decided once I picked up all of this weight, which I think most women experience, and Jacqueline, you'll speak a lot to this. 
I decided that the best thing for me to do was what I've always taught my clients to do was eat less, count calories and exercise harder. Wonderful. It's a winning formula. Except little did I know that in perimenopause, the solution does not work. In fact, it probably stresses the body more and can sometimes even cause more weight gain. I see a cousin who is male in the background. I'm speaking about women's things. And I don't know, Tony, I don't know if you want to be here for this. <laughs> okay, right. So um, when all of this happened, yes, I did eat a little bit less, exercise a bit harder and a little bit of weight came off, but nothing, nothing, to take off all of those nine kilos. And I was frustrated. I couldn't understand what was going on. I was more irritable. I stopped sleeping so well. My skin was breaking out. I really didn't know what was happening. And when I finally put all the pieces together, literally from listening to some of the other guest experts that you had on the summit last year, and I realized that this was all hormonal, I finally knew what I needed to do. And we're gonna discuss a lot of that tonight. And this is where I want to begin our conversation, because I think this is something that you hear so much from from a lot of women who come to you. What are the main um, concerns that women come to you with, specifically also if they don't even realize that what is going on for them is hormonal? Yes, so... Um, there are really there's so much to unpack about what you've said and there are two things that I want to relate to the first thing is being in perimenopause and not realizing you're in perimenopause and the second thing is and remind me to come back to it that exactly what you did which is what so many women believe because it worked in our 20s and our 30s I've put on some weight I'll eat less I'll go on that diet I'll exercise more, I'll burn more calories and I'll lose the weight and fit into that dress. Exactly that same um, system that you did in your 20s that probably worked. You know, like you had a wedding, you had a family event, you had a function, you needed to lose a couple of pounds to get into the dress you wanted to fit into. And in your 20s and probably in your 30s, it worked. In your 40s and your 50s, it does not work anymore. And I want to come back to that point. Um, but yeah, most of my clients come to me um, for two reasons. The first one is they have often gone to their doctor, done the res- what they have thought is the responsible thing. They've gone to their doctor because they're complaining about weight gain, feeling totally stressed out, exhausted, their sleep has changed. Uh, they've got achy joints and they think maybe they need some, you know, they've got early onset rheumatoid arthritis or their brain function, they're being more forgetful, brain fog, they think they've got early onset dementia or heart palpitations and they're like, oh my gosh, like I'm about to have a heart attack. A lot of different things they keep going back to their doctor with um, in normally around your 40s, um, early, mid, even late 40s. Um, and the doctor will treat the complaint that you have come into the surgery with. Very, very rarely will that doctor ever even utter the words perimenopause in relation to the symptoms you're talking about. And what usually happens is you get treated for the symptom you've come in with. Often you'll get a medication. More than often you will be sent away with some blood work or some tests that will usually come back normal. And your doctor will say, everything looks normal, it's fine, you're probably just really stressed out, try and reduce your stress a little bit more, try and make some more time for yourself, you know, if things get worse, if you don't feel good, come back in another six months. That is really not serving women at this stage. Um, The other group of women that will come to me will maybe have heard certain things, or maybe come to me for the stereotypical symptoms like hot flushes, night sweats, weight gain, brain fog and say like I think I'm perimenopause and I'm not quite sure but I know like something doesn't feel right you know I know you're a menopause coach you know can you help me and then I ask a question at this point in time they're still having a period so it's not like they've stopped having a period they're still having those symptoms with still menstruating okay that is perimenopause perimenopause is this stage of life that can be confusing because Either you've got a regular period or your period is changing a little bit, but you still have a period. 
this word of perimenopause, this phase of perimenopause is so um, misunderstood or just not understood. We all think we know what menopause is, hot flashes, night sweats, brain fog, weight gain. That's four symptoms out of a list of potentially 75 that you could be experiencing. Very few women have all 75. Oh, yes. No one has all 75. But during perimenopause, these years leading up to menopause, 12 period free months, lots and lots and lots of things are changing. And, but women don't recognize and we are not educated or informed or not being told by our doctors what perimenopause is, how it can show up, the range and variety of symptoms, and the extent and the changes and the fact that it is physical, emotional, cognitive, that's brain function, and for many, many women, deeply spiritual in that they feel that something is changing, but they can't exactly place their finger on it. You just don't feel the same. The same things that used to work just don't work anymore. You don't want to do the same things. For so many women, especially Jewish women who are so used to entertaining or doing, you know, being active in the community or giving to others, they just don't want to show up that way anymore. And it's a really difficult thing of like, but like something's changing, but you don't really want it to change and you're embarrassed to admit it. And so there is, for many women, a can't put my finger exactly on what's going on but something is changing. And that is also perimenopause. So when we actually, when I sit down with my clients and I go through the checklist and I'm like, okay, fine, you come to me for X, Y, and Z, but all of a sudden there's A, B, C, and D, and they're like, oh my gosh, that is also perimenopause. And then there is that big sigh of relief. Yeah. I'm not crazy. I'm not mad. I'm not dying. I don't have a severe illness. Um, it's not I, only me. It's not only me. It's me. Yeah. And then comes the frustration. Why is no one talking about this? Why did my doctor not tell me? I wish I would have found you earlier. But we are where we are and there are things to do about it. And I say that it doesn't matter when or how you came to me. Now there's something we can do about it. There is so much you can do to heal your hormones, relieve your symptoms, and navigate this stage of life with ease, joy, and confidence. And more importantly, set yourself up for a fabulous postmenopause life. I believe it's wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> That's what they say. As I said, as I said in the podcast, I was interviewed for a podcast last week, and I said, you would not want to meet a postmenopausal woman in a dark alley because the postmenopausal woman is the superhero stage of the women's life cycle. That is where she has all her superpowers, is ready to go and doesn't care what anyone thinks and what anyone says. She knows who she is, oh what my. she's doing, what she believes in. You would not want to meet her in a dark alley. Well, I think we, we are all looking forward to that day when we really come into our full essence and power. It's interesting, while you were speaking, it made me think of a client of mine, and I think maybe many women on the call can actually ad identify with this. She started experiencing night sweats at the age of 40 and didn't know why, and went to her doctor. She's always had anxiety, but went to her doctor with more, like a much more pronounced anxiety. So the doctor said, go, to, go back to your psychiatrist. And the psychiatrist put her on more and more anti-anxiety medication, which did nothing. And only when she started working with me a few months ago, and I said to her, but that's, that's you know, that's part of the, the whole perimenopause cycle. And the fact that you were in, you know, getting night sweats at 40, she's now 45 and she still gets her period. So she yeah. didn't make any connection. And I said, we've got to heal these hormones first. So I suppose my question to you is this, how does this dip in, and I know there are more hormones than just the estrogen, progesterone, testosterone, but how do the, the, the 
dips in the main ones that we think about, mainly progesterone and estrogen, affect things like anxiety, affect us that cause these symptoms of, you know, for me, it was joint pain, very, yeah. very, except, like joint pain, which thank God has cleared up because of the changes that I made to my lifestyle, to the way that I was eating. Can you explain a little bit more about how the body produces estrogen up until the age of around 40? What happens in this period of time for those women who are ready and, and wanting to prepare for, you know, they may not be experiencing symptoms yet. And if I, I, I'm so excited if you're on this call and if you see this video and you don't have symptoms and you're preparing your body for it, I think that's wonderful. What, what changes happen in the body? And and how do these symptoms come to be? Okay, so I'm going to try and make it as simple as possible because it can get quite, um, we can get quite into it and quite into the details of hormones. And that is something that I really enjoy talking about. So I'm going to try and make it as simple as possible. We all have an endocrine system and there are about 50 different hormones in our endocrine hormonal system. For women, the hormones that we focus on the most are our reproductive hormones, the estrogen, the progesterone, yes, the testosterone, and the two other hormones, LH, luteinizing hormone, and FSH, follicle stimulating hormone. Those are the hormones that manage our menstrual cycle, our fertility cycle. Let's assume that everything is equal and everything is working fine and everything is in balance in your 20s and 30s, which we call our fertility years, our reproductive years. It is irrelevant whether you have um, given birth to children, being pregnant or not. That's irrelevant for our conversation. At a certain point, our natural, normal hormonal life cycle will mean that after these reproductive years, we enter perimenopause. In perimenopause, those hormones specifically estrogen, progesterone, and testosterone. And I don't want to ignore testosterone because testosterone is really important and it is not talked about enough in the, uh, the impact it has on menopause symptoms. So those three hormones begin to fluctuate. Progesterone goes nicely down. Estrogen is going up and down and doing a roller coaster. And testosterone is also doing a bit of a roller coaster. The aim, the end point is that in postmenopause, these hormones reach a new low balanced level. They are all going down. In postmenopause, they will reach a new low balanced level. Okay. They're never zero. They just, it, it, we it's should a not new level. Be zero. We should not be zero. For many women, some of their symptoms are because in this perimenopause, menopause fluctuating hormonal time, Sometimes those hormones are dropping too low. But in postmenopause, they are not zero. They are there, they exist, but at new low balance maintenance levels. Okay. Estrogen, let me focus on estrogen for the moment because estrogen has become um, really um, known as the women's health hormone. It is the women's health regulator. It helps to maintain so many functions in the body and it helps to regulate so many other hormones going on in our body. So as estrogen is fluctuating and changing and doing this roller coaster ride, it begins to have knock-on effects on some other very critical hormones. Cortisol, which is our stress hormone, insulin, which is our blood sugar rate regulating hormone, um, Thyroid hormones, T3, T4. I'm not talking here about TSH, the thyroid stimulating hormone, which is the only hormone doctors will check to test your thyroid. We're going to talk about that later on. That's I want to get so that. Oh boy. <laughs> but other hormones in your thyroid panel, cholesterol, um, and other hormones such as melatonin, your sleep hormone serotonin, your um, feel-good hormone, and other brain-functioning hormones, leptin and ghrelin, your satiating and... Those are very important because that then affects how hungry you are. It also affects how much fat your body is storing in your cells. So you all of those hormones are impacted by the fluctuating estrogen. 
There are estrogen receptor cells in every single part of our body. So, and that is why there is such a wide variety of potential symptoms because dry eyes, dry skin, hair falling out, vaginal dryness, um, achy joints, all of those heart palpitations are all related to um, reductions of estrogen and fluctuating estrogen. But it is not just the absolute value of estrogen that we need to look at. We also need to look at estrogen in relationship to progesterone because estrogen and progesterone, the other um, critical hormone in our menstrual cycle, work together. And progesterone is the feel-good hormone. It's the emotional stabilizing hormone. And when it falls in our menstrual cycle pre your bleed, when we often will have PMS-like symptoms, drop in energy, drop in um, moods, anxiety, depression, mood swings, lack of patience, all of those things are related to the fluctuating progesterone. And if the gap is too big between estrogen and progesterone, or if estrogen drops below progesterone, it's not about the absolute number, it's about the relationship also between those two hormones. And progesterone also has a lot of um, knock-on effects to how we feel, to the way that other, um, other hormones and other things work in our body. And the last one is testosterone. I wanna mention testosterone because for many women, if they go to their doctor who is happy to prescribe an HRT, hormone replacement therapy type of treatment, if that is what the woman is asking for, the hormone they will only ever talk about is estrogen and often progesterone because it goes together. If you have a womb, if you have a uterus, you will need progesterone. But the focus is always on estrogen. Testosterone is never mentioned and testosterone, um, I've had some menopause specialist doctors say, Testosterone is the first place to start, not the last place to start. Low energy, low libido, motivation, even brain function, focus, short-term memory loss, all of that type of stuff, it's all testosterone. Um, how would a doctor, can I ask you, how would a doctor, sorry, maybe we're jumping ahead here, like give you, do they have to give you like a testosterone cream? Are there like supplements that you can take for that? You know, would your average doctor know what to test for? Yeah, testosterone is a little bit more complicated. Um, last night I ran the HRT masterclass when I went deep down and did a deep, deep dive for my um, audience on all things related to um, HRT, the good, the bad, the ugly, the pros, the cons, the history, the what happens now, the different types of hormones. It's a little bit, it's a complicated topic. It's very nuanced. And if you're going to a doctor who either doesn't know what they're talking about or is refusing to give you hormone therapy, if that's a direction you want to go into, you need to go and find another doctor. But specifically about testosterone, it normally comes in a gel or a cream. Um, it is only approved as a male hormonal treatment, but menopause specialists who understand hormones and menopause and menopause symptoms in women know how to prescribe it as a dosage for women. It is normally a ninth or a tenth of a male dosage. Transdermal, and you have to rub, 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 rub it in, rub it in, rub it in. And there is no risk of taking testosterone. One of the problems that um, one of the myths associated with testosterone hormonal therapy is that you're going to start developing um, excess hair, bigger muscles, more male characteristics. It's absolute rubbish because you will never be taking a dosage that is equivalent to the male dosage. And women have testosterone naturally and normally in our bodies. It is a part of our reproductive cycle. So we deserve to have that um, reinforced and supported if our testosterone has dropped very, very low. Okay, so that's all very, okay, so that's amazing and very important. I, I want to ask you- I just yeah. want to relate to something because I think it's really important here to um, be really exact about the nuances and the language that we're using. Okay. Menopause is a natural, normal, hormonal fluctuating time. So many women, will turn around and say, but if it's normal and natural and part of my biological life cycle, why do I have symptoms? Why am I suffering? Why am I experiencing weight gain, heart palpitations, low energy, depression, anxiety, low libido? If this is normal, 
Why is God doing this to me? Why does it feel so bad? Yeah, yeah. Why is this? And so many women are like, okay, this is part of what it means to be a woman. We suffer during pregnancy. We suffer during childbirth. We suffer during menopause. This is what it means. I really, really want to flip that narrative because I don't believe it serves any of us. And I feel it takes away our autonomy over our bodies, our connection to our bodies, and to really get empowered and engaged in our own women's health journey. So we often feed into this narrative that that, that is a woman's lot. Pain and suffering and struggle throughout our life cycle related to all the things that women have to go through. I don't really believe that. I think it is a narrative that we have been fed and has been reinforced in our society. But yes, women do experience symptoms. Women do experience pain. Women do experience suffering and struggling and confusion. But I don't believe that is a prerequisite to your menopause experience. So even though this is a normal, natural hormonal fluctuating time, it can be exacerbated. Your hormonal imbalance can be exacerbated. Your symptoms can be exacerbated by these external hormonal um, triggers and by what has gone on in your 20s and your 30s and how you show up at perimenopause. Your um, health story in the lead up to perimenopause, your stress, your, you know, the nutrition and food you're eating, the gut health that you are experiencing, the sleep you are not having, the movement that you are or not having that may be putting your body into more stress, the self-care you are or are not doing, all of those factors are triggers that potentially can exacerbate your hormonal imbalance. And those are the areas that I work with my clients to figure out what is going on in each of those areas that we can help to then um, replenish, restore, support, so that we can, as much as we are able to do within our own control, to really help to support our long-term hormonal health and relieve our symptoms. So even though people may not have necessarily supported their bodies adequately in their 20s and 30s, maybe they haven't necessarily exercised or perhaps stress has been a big factor or sleep has been, you know, not, not, not a priority, perhaps for reasons outside of their control, um, trauma situations, stress situations, you know, all of that sometimes we don't, we, is not in our control and maybe in our 20s and 30s, we don't really think this is going to have an impact on me long term and this is going to affect my hormonal health. So why should I care about it now? I'll deal with it when the time comes. Even if this has not been ideally set up, can we start afresh? Is there a possibility of still achieving better hormonal health and reducing symptoms in perimenopause and menopause, even if you haven't already had that foundation to work on? A thousand percent, yes. Okay. I believe that the minute the woman, a woman, decides that she is going to become proactive and engaged in her healthcare journey, you can even make small changes and have big impact. Um, both you and I are busy working mothers. We are juggling a lot. I believe that, and as you know from, from working with me, I believe in making small, realistic, practical changes that you are going to be able to implement that are really personalized to where you are, what identifying the triggers, the main triggers that may be your, you know, specific and unique to you, and supporting you to help implement the changes so that you can begin to really feel better. And those changes may be as simple as, and I will give an example of one of my clients, moving your bedtime. My, one of my clients was going, for her, this was her small thing that she could do. She was going to bed as all of us women do, way too late. Um, she moved her bedtime from 1.30 in the morning till 11 o'clock. That for her was something she could do. She told her kids, she warned her kids, from 11 o'clock, I'm going into my room, I'm closing the door. I'm around for anything you need until 11 o'clock. At 11 o'clock, I'm going into my bedroom. She then started her nighttime rituals. She was in bed by 11.30. That small change, in addition to um, cutting out, changing what she was eating in the morning when she woke up, 
she was having her cup of coffee with her cookie. Changing <laughs> that, those two things together, changing the bedtime, bringing it forward and changing how she broke her, you know, her fast, what, yes. what she did with her breakfast in the morning. Those two things revolutionized things for her. But for another woman, it may be something totally different. And when I work with my clients, I'm listening to what you are telling me about what is going on in your life and what is realistic for you. Because if I'm going to give you a checklist of 30 things to do and none of them are, yeah. first, it's overwhelming. And if you've got brain fog, anxiety, low energy, and any of those things, a checklist of 30 is going to go straight in the dustbin. Yeah, it's the end of another long list of another thing, you know, things that, you, that you're doing already. Exactly. But if, let's say, we can say, you know, let's, change what you're eating in the morning as as a as your breakfast meal or if we can figure out maybe actually you're doing all things right you think you're doing all things right because I have women who I'm sure women say to you I have a really healthy diet I really you know prioritize my exercise and I have a really healthy diet and then I'm listening to what their exercise routine is and I'm realizing that for some reason their exercise routine is actually creating as you said more stress in the body and, that's and that something, is something yeah that is really really coming up and people laugh and they're like I know you know they, they think um when we say exercise is stressing out the body they think that means you have to be five hours at the gym and that is an over exercising person so that's something very interesting and something that I actually guide my clients on in fact sometimes I ask the woman that I'm working with to decrease the amount of cardiovascular exercise that they're doing because and I think this is very interesting for everybody to hear that high intensity cardiovascular exercise actually increases cortisol levels, which is a stress for the body. And at different times of day, when your cortisol level is either rising or falling, and that also goes according to, you know, our circadian rhythm, it's supposed to be more elevated. Its peak should be at 8 a.m. and it should decrease as the day goes on. And then melatonin, which helps us with sleep, should spike as like now the sun is setting. But if you exercise and you do intensity, intense exercise later in the day, you actually increase your cortisol again. And then many women complain to me, first of all, that causes weight gain. And second of all, they're not sleeping well at night because their cortisol levels are elevated and their body has not had the opportunity to produce melatonin at night and allow for that whole calming system. You know, the other thing I wanted to say to you about the, the sleep, which is really, really important, is that, um, and it's a study that I read, that your adrenal glands, which are the glands that are responsible for producing cortisol and for producing adrenaline, which is our body's fight and flight response, if we are going to sleep later than a certain time of day, we are still um, causing those glands to overproduce cortisol and adrenaline, and they never completely calm down. And also when we sleep over a certain period of time, we allow our body's rest and recovery whole phase, which is managed by the vagus nerve, which is another whole other topic, which we're not going to get a chance to speak to tonight, but we can always speak about it another time. But that that very calming phase never has the ability to really come into its own. And that is why, you know, when, when women say to me, but I still get seven hours sleep if I'm sleeping from 1.30 in the morning to 8.30 in the morning. It's yeah. not about always the amount of sleep that you're getting. It's sometimes the time that you go to sleep in order to be able to help balance the cortisol levels. And this is something I think I want to lead into with you is the effect of stress and cortisol on low estrogen. And I know we're going to come to this because I think one of the most important things I want the, like, the ladies on the call to understand is that where our estrogen is produced, our body produces it in, my, from my understanding, three different main areas. Um, one being the most potent, then a little bit less potent and the third one being a lot less potent if am i correct in that like they all there are three different types of estrogen, of estrogen. in the body yeah. yeah there are three different types of estrogen in the body um they are made predominantly in the same places but they are dominant at different phases of our life cycle the most common one is um estradiol um, there is estrone, and I'm going to find the name for the other one because I also had a um, 
I forgot it yesterday, but I'm gonna have it. But in the meantime, I wanna, I'm smiling so much because um, stress is so underrated as a hormone disruptor. And the relationship between stress and um, estrogen is very, very un, um, not understood. So let's just, um, for a minute, if we can, um, just talk about that relationship of stress and estrogen. And, and as you said, where is estrogen made? Estrogen is made in three different places. Estrogen is made in the um, ovaries, predominantly in the ovaries. It is then made in the adrenal glands and the adrenal glands really take up the uh, process of estrogen production as the ovaries stop in menopause producing the estrogen. The adrenal glands are meant to then take up the, um, the estrogen production. And estrogen is also made in fat cells. Fat cells, fat exactly. Cells. Right. So this is where all the women need to know, very importantly, why weight gain is so easy and why losing the weight is so difficult because when your body needs your fat cells to produce estrogen it is not going to let that body fat go so easily so I want to speak a lot more about the adrenals and that as well if we can if we can go there yep 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 okay so what happens is firstly when the um I just want to go back on the three different types of estrogen estrone um, is the primary estrogen that we make, that the body makes after menopause. So in post-menopause, estrone is the dominant one. Estradiol is the main hormone that is dominant throughout our reproductive years. And that is the hormone that is mostly being tested um, when you're doing a blood test to check your estrogen levels. They're mostly checking estradiol. And estriol is the dominant form of estrogen that is um, dominant during pregnancy. So those are the three types of hormones. So really, when your doctor is doing blood work, they really want to check estrone and estradiol, not only estradiol. I don't think I've ever seen a blood report that has estrone checked. It's always estradiol. Always, always estradiol, always. And obviously, each of those hormones do specific things. Um, they have different potencies. They have different... Um, um, sort of interactions, we group them as estrogen, but if you want to get really technical and really scientific, there really are, and there actually is a fourth one, which um, um, I'm going to not talk about. That. Don't worry there, about it. Let's, yeah, let's, exactly. let's get to those. But, but the ones that we really want to be focusing in are estrone, which is dominant in postmenopause, and estradiol, because that is the hormone that is most dominant in our fertility years and is fluctuating and changing. Um, but yes, you want to make sure that, that both of those are being tested in your blood work. Um, so yes, yeah, so we said that our ovaries are producing the hormones. As we get into closer to menopause, estrogen production in our ovaries is reducing. And what should take up the estrogen production is our adrenal glands. But for some people, our adrenal glands have been working over time in stress management. There are four types of stress, and I'm not gonna go into all of them, but stress is not just, oh my God, I've got a deadline, I'm totally stressed out. There are other types of stress. There is trauma stress, there is chronic stress of a family situation or you know, aging parents or stress that is just not going away. It's not going to be you put you given the project that had the work deadline and they're like, oh my gosh. Okay, so those are a lot more like now. emotional stresses, like ongoing. And I, I think that's something from with for me that I work a very closely with clients on yeah. mindset, the mindset side of things, because very often our thoughts and our emotions and our feelings that we have about our life in general has such an impact. Well, I see it with how people make choices of food, but I also know that it has a really big impact on stress and cortisol levels. And in order to help them reduce that, we we work on, on that side of things as well. So, and there is also um, biological stress, exposure to toxins, exposure to mold or other things. And you, we should not take that for granted. So you have stress. Your body has been dealing with stress in our 21st century living 
pretty much 24 hours a day. There is really never a time, even the pinging of the phone, even listening to the news, even the fact that my son on his day camp school bus was stuck in traffic for three hours because of a demonstration meant that the whole morning, I was like on edge. I was alert. I was like talking to my son and what's going on and how is he? And is he okay? And that is your body, that is your body interprets that experience as stress. Stress then has biological implications, emotional implications. We're not going to go too much into it now, but there are real physiological things that happen in your body. And if you are in constant stress, those physiological things are going on constantly and your body doesn't have that calm down, that switch off the switch off of the sympathetic nervous system and the activation of the parasympathetic nervous system, that re-regulation, you lose the resilience that your body has to deal with ups and downs and stress triggers because the triggers never go away. Um, and that has consequences on your long-term health and well-being. Estrogen keeps all of that in check, which is why in your 20s and your 30s, you can cope and manage. And do things that when you think about it afterwards, you're like, how was I a young mom raising kids and having a full-time job and entertaining on the weekends and, 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 because in our 20s and our 30s, the predictability of our hormones allows us somehow to sort of function unless, God forbid, things fall off but the isn't it Also, because in our 20s and 30s, our ovaries are producing estrogen. So we are not relying on the adrenal glands for that production. Whereas when we are stressed in our 40s and 50s and our adrenal glands are meant to take over the production of estrogen, it can't, it can't happen. So yeah, it's more than that, though. It's also that the estrogen is supportive and protective. So when there is predictable estrogen and when your body knows what's going on and there are good amounts of estrogen in your body in your 20s and your 30s, it is women's health protective. It is immune system inflammatory protective. It is heart protective. It is bone protective estrogen. So it's there and it's sort of holding everything in place. The minute that it becomes unpredictable and the minute that that sort of protect protection disappears and the, east, the adrenal glands now need to help with estrogen production, but the adrenal glands are like, uh-uh, I'm out of here, goodbye. You've been working <laughs> for the last 25 years and now you want to be to do something else? I'm not supporting you, which then has major knock-on effects on the thyroid, on the HP axis. Um, stress um, cycle on the HPT access stress cycle. These all the adrenal glands and the thyroids are really, really inter, um, interconnected. And when the adrenal glands start to um, say goodbye, no thank you, it has knock on effects on everything else. And when our body has been overstressed and now is required to do more things, but estrogen is fluctuating, progesterone is decreasing, testosterone is fluctuating, and you don't have the resilience to deal with all of this, it's no wonder that women are experiencing menopause symptoms. It's but no wonder thing that all you want to do is stay in bed. So that's something like I feel like a lot of people that I speak to, a lot of women that I work with, they feel like they're dragging themselves through the day because of this. And the other thing that I'm noticing, and I'm wondering if it's connected, I think it is, is that we see a lot more autoimmune conditions being diagnosed at this time of life. And I think that it has a lot to do also with the adrenal glands just and the estrogen, the loss of protection of the estrogen, um, which lowers immunity and increases inflammation. So I think that is also part which is, you know, leads into and, the- And also, as you know very well, um, stress, Continual stress, continual cortisol production um, impacts long-term gut health. Our digestive system is impaired when we, are in, when we are in continual stress mode. The normal natural biological process is, is that when you are in stress mode, running away from the bear or the tiger until you reach your tribe or your cave and you can then calm yourself down, the body shuts down all non-essential functionings, which makes sense because when you're running away and when your life is in danger um, and your adrenal glands are in stress response, we need 
blood sugar to support our cells that need to run away and have the energy. We need hypervigilance. We need a high heart rate. We need awareness and yeah, that hypervigilance. And blood flow to our main muscle groups and away from our gut. Exactly. What we don't need is digestion. What we don't need is reproduction. What we don't need is hormonal balance. What we don't need is that calm, relaxed state. So when we are in constant stress mode, stress, poor gut health, more inflammation just goes hand in hand. And as we know, about 80% of our immune system is in our gut. So the minute your digestive system and your gut health has been compromised, that means that your inflammatory response, your immune system is compromised. That means that it's it, so it, it all sort of is this nice big them. melting pot of all these things working together. And also one thing to bear in mind, and this is something like, for example, yesterday I had a, a new client intake. She has had IBS most of her life. I think also very stress related. She admits that she's quite an anxious person, but I was taking her history. And besides the IBS symptoms that she's experiencing, she, like I was ticking off the list, all the perimenopause symptoms for her. She's 42 and she's definitely in perimenopause. Um, but I think even like not such an obvious case like that where you may be getting like extensive diarrhea but like just all of a sudden where you used to be able to eat certain foods now you're getting more bloated you're getting more gassy you're experiencing more constipation than normal this is all part of the reduced or the the, the decrease in the, your hormones and the the impact of hormonal balance as well as stress and poor gut health so it really is all intertwined so I'm smiling because um, I will share a little bit about my um, personal experience that we know in perimenopause, the saying is what worked for you before will not work for you now. And one of the ways that I entered for myself into this whole perimenopause journey was by realizing um, I spent a year with um, stomach pain and bloating every Saturday night and Sunday. And I couldn't understand why. I couldn't understand why I would spend Sunday morning looking like I was, you know, six months pregnant, why I had such awful um, stomach cramps, bloating, gas. Um, I was not going, I did, was not having regular um, toilets. Oh. <laughs> toilet experiences. I was having regular bowel movements. Um, I was very much constipated. Through my own journey, my own process, I basically realized that the foods that I used to eat were not working for me anymore. And I removed um, the sugar, the carbs, the gluten. And it has made a tremendous, tremendous impact in my life. I want to tell you what happened in the last week. Last weekend, we had a family celebration. I was away for the weekend, parties, food, alcohol, fun and games. Sunday, I felt awful. I did not realize how bad I would feel because there are certain foods I still don't eat. Like I will not eat the roast potatoes. There are foods I will not eat. I thought I was being careful, but obviously I wasn't being as careful as I thought I was. And yeah, it's a celebration. So that's fine. You can enjoy yourself. I'm not saying you can't enjoy yourself, but it took me four days of eating the way that I know to eat until I had my stomach back until I was not bloated, until I did not feel just deeply uncomfortable in my body. Mm. And women live like that without even knowing that that is, that there's another way. They live like mm. that. And mm. it's not even about the weight. It's about how you just feel. As we know, poor gut health, um, eating these trigger foods like sugar, carbohydrates, pure carbohydrates, gluten, wheat products, not only impacts how you're feeling, not only gives you a six month looking stomach, pregnancy stomach, but impacts mood, energy, brain function, anxiety, joint pain, all of these types of things. And women don't, that's why women don't even know there is another way to heal themselves until they work with women who 
Especially okay, so so let's move on to that because I think it's important that we've painted a picture of what can go really wrong and how terrible and crappy we can really feel. But I think what I'd love to be able to give the ladies who've signed up for this tonight um, a message of hope and a you know, you've already des described how important it is. You don't have to make very big changes. I think that's something that we both are very much in alignment and agreement with. I know that as women, we sometimes want to completely feel better in one day, um, you know, look in the mirror and, and recognize ourselves again, feel comfortable in our body in one day, weigh what we want. You know, we've spoken about this before, wear the black dress that we've, you know, that's hanging up in the cupboard. Yeah. But sometimes we have to, first of all, um, change the picture of what we are expecting. Um, sometimes we do have to accept that there are changes, but also address things and approach things in a more stepwise and a small, I always say baby steps way. You know, one of the main any any of the ladies who've worked with me in my in my 12-week program and any of my clients know that my most famous phrase is progress not perfection and I think when we expect perfection of ourselves or to feel always amazing sometimes we set ourselves up for failure and it's important to always be able to give ourselves the um the right support and also the the you see brain fog the the pat on the back the the accolades for doing what we can do and doing things yeah. small because even though it may not seem that simple things make a big difference they really and truly can um yeah. it can make a difference to like for example just you know at night time if sleep is an issue for you dimming the lights in your house half an hour before you're going to go to bed or trying not to be on your phone for that like the last 10 minutes even before going to sleep can really have a big difference to the whole quality of sleep that you have and if you sleep better then your cortisol levels are better and your estrogen levels are better and you're not as tired the next day so what I'd like to do in the I, I didn't know how long we were going to speak for and I know that we can probably speak for another three hours on so much more but I think if we can just isolate and identify the main areas that um, need to be addressed and perhaps you can give one or two simple tips of those that you know work really well whether it's because it's worked for you or you've seen with your own clients that it works really well as well. Okay, so the first thing is, and, and this is a very personalized approach, and there is like sort of general outlines and general guidelines, but really every woman needs to go on her journey, preferably with the support of someone who knows what they're talking about. The first thing is really to identify the triggers for hormonal imbalance, the external triggers, whether it be from the stress, from the nutrition and your gut health, from sleep from movement and exercise or self-care. What in those five areas, those are the five areas for me that are going to create um, what, you know, what you are or not doing in each of those five areas is going to impact and exacerbate your hormonal imbalance. We then need to remove those triggers, but most importantly, replace them with positive um, actions. So, doing five of the things that, as I said, are personalized and appropriate for you in each of those five areas. And for some women, one of those five pillars may be less relevant because it may not be the thing that is really the critical thing that she needs to be working on. Or maybe she's doing some stuff in that area. You know, she gives herself time um, for self-care. Maybe it's not enough, but for the moment, it's, it's perfectly fine. So what are the small changes and never removing without replacing, never taking something away with, with saying, okay, but what do I do instead? We then always need to make sure that we are supporting the system, whether it be through practices or supplementation or extra herbs, vitamins, or things that we need to be taking. And often um, that is one of the areas that we can do most easily. I find that most women need extra magnesium, vitamin d usually iron zinc and omega-3s those are the five basic supplements and again you may choose to have some blood work done to see what your levels are but in general um one of the easiest things that women can start doing to begin to change the way they feel is take 
magnesium, glycinate supplement, vitamin D, zinc, iron, iron, and omega-3. Omega I just want to add on to that uh, something that's very important. Your vitamin D status is something that the doctor generally will check. And there is a very simple equation to be able to determine how much vitamin D you need to replace. Yeah. So, you know, some of the functional medicine doctors really want to put you on a very, very high dosage of vitamin D. It is a fat soluble vitamin. It does affect liver function. So it's something that I am always a little bit more cautious with. So that is something that does need to be personalized. I want to reiterate that the magnesium that is more supportive is magnesium glycinate because there are a number of different magnesiums on the market. Yeah. And magnesium, one of the benefits of that is that it helps with sleep as well. So, yeah. and muscle relaxation. So if you're finding that it's very difficult for you to sleep at night, taking a magnesium supplement is a very good idea, especially the magnesium glycinate. I don't know about you, Jacqueline, but I normally recommend 400 milligrams as the dosage of that. I say anywhere from 400 to 800. I usually take 800. It really depends on your symptoms, how you're feeling, start and see how you so feel. Some people can get a bit of diarrhea from a much higher dose. So if you if you have a slightly looser stool, then then I would stick yeah. to 400. Yeah. 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 So there. So yeah. So go again. We can assess the exact amount that you want to take the um, the the dosage, etc. Mm -hmm. But those are the five that you should be taking. So we want to identify the triggers remove and replace them with practices that are appropriate for you. We want to support the body. We want to really engage in a process of healing and repair and really understand what is going on with your hormones in areas possibly like with your adrenal glands. I, one thing I really, really want to stress here is that we're talking specifically and especially about menopause symptoms and all the different ways your body is changing in perimenopause and the ways that perimenopause can show up with these potentially 75 different symptoms. I always tell my clients, go get your blood work done, go get checked out, because it may be that there are other things also going on. In my mind, 95, even 99% of the time, it is only perimenopause. But even only perimenopause can have knock-on effects with thyroid. It can make the thyroid glands, the thyroid function, more uh, less stable. So I always want to see what else is going on in the body, what else is happening, checking all the other blood work, not only your reproductive um, hormone levels, but to see what else is happening, what is going on with your gut health, what is happening with inflammation in the body, what is happening with blood sugar, with your insulin, with your cholesterol levels. So because not only are there knock-on effects from, as we've talked about, the fluctuating estrogen, but there may be other underlying things from 20 years of lifestyle that may be playing a role. So I really wanna see what else is going on, um, where else do we need to heal, the body in other areas that at the end of the day are going to create long-term um, health and long-term resilience and really build your system for long-term health and well-being. Thank you. Right. So I think there's one more thing that I wanted to address, and this is a question that everybody has, and this is the weight side of things and what to eat. This is a very, very big topic. And uh, I, I feel that it's important that the same way that you need a unique approach to hormone therapy, to how you're supporting your body, to whether stress is something you need to look at or sleep, everybody needs a different way of eating and no one way will work for everybody. Um, I am... You know, I have my my approach. I know, Jacqueline, you, you differ a little bit from me. Um, but the truth is that it's important that no matter who I'm working with, I work with what is most supportive for their bodies. So for some people, I will still give them certain carbohydrates. For others, you know, I focus a lot more on balancing blood sugar levels and preventing postprandial after eating blood sugar and insulin spikes more than worrying about whether we are or aren't including carbohydrates. There's a lot of evidence that intermittent fasting is very beneficial and even the ketogenic diet for, for women in, in midlife and for some women it works and for some women it doesn't. So I think it's also a very important message that 
no matter what you 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 hear out there, there's a lot of information. There can be a lot of overwhelming information about what you should be having or shouldn't be having. That's another reason to work with a professional who understands, um, who can look at your unique picture, who can identify what will be most supportive for your body and take everything into account. Because yeah. if you're just going to do intermittent fasting, but you stressed about only being able to eat by a certain time, then that stress is going to compound your cortisol levels, which is going to not be beneficial for you. Yeah. So, so I think something important that we also just need to make, you know, make very clear. Yes. And I agree with you. I think that there are, I agree with you that it has to be personalized. I agree that it has to relate to what your situation is, what your symptoms are, what you are experiencing. But I think there are some basic guidelines, which we do agree on, but the nuance may change. So I think we both agree that um, women in midlife need more protein and more healthy fats. Correct. We need less sugar and less gluten or wheat-based products. Definitely. I think wheat more than more wheat definitely yeah, yeah. is something that I'm yeah. Yeah. We need more vegetables and more of a range of good vegetables. I think we also know that we need to have more of an anti-inflammatory diet. Correct. It means boosting certain foods that are supporting our um, immune system and removing those foods that are triggering to the immune system. And I think that when it comes to things like intermittent fasting, which is taking X number of hours a day where you're not eating and X number of hours a day where you have an eating window, um, I do one thing that works for me but I need to hear what works for my client, but the principle is true. We need to be having a smaller eating window and a larger non-eating window. When that window is, how it works for you, et cetera, et cetera, I, you know, we work together with our clients to figure that out. But I think there are some basic principles. The other basic principles are um, listening to your body when you are eating certain foods that may or may not be triggering for you, but have the potential. So for some women, dairy is a real triggering food that really exacerbates your symptoms. And for other women, they can tolerate dairy. For some women, legumes, beans, and, and um, lentils can be really triggering. Digestive system, bloating, gas, um, those types of things. So even though they are definitely healthy sources of fiber, healthy sources of carbs, for some women, their digestive system can't handle it for whatever reason. So um, there were, I, I have a certain um, list of foods that in theory are good and healthy, but I really want to assess your personal response. For me, even though I know that legumes and beans and lentils are a really good plant-based source of fiber i haven't yet found the right one that sit well with me interesting so there's there's there's, there's some tricks to that as well sometimes the length of time that you soak it for and what and you know how you cook it how long you cook it that can also can have a, can have an impact so there are some tricks to it yeah. but yes sometimes there are women that just are unable to um deal with the fermentable part of of those kind of legumes i see you being called as a mom at the moment jacqueline <laughs> yeah no it's um I, I i agree with you i totally agree with you it's um it, we need to know the tricks of what is going to work but most for me the most important thing is that the woman is listening to her body absolutely and how absolutely. her body is responding with different with, with different foods and we know there are certain foods that are going to be good and there are certain foods that are potentially triggering and a great example is um with you is i know that there are certain um vegetables that are really good for promoting um anti-inflammatory like onions garlics and things like that but for some women those foods are really really good them. Them. absolutely yeah. Absolutely. So, so we need to know what we're talking about. We need to know the information and then Absolutely. we need to help guide the client through Absolutely. figuring out. 
but for me, there are some guiding principles yes. um, that, are, that are most important. Absolutely. I think there's one more point that I wanted to make, and then I'm actually going to open up to some questions. I know somebody typed in the chat, she wants you to just put your five pillars, if you can just write that in the chat, um, just to while I'm speaking. I think the last thing that is always a question that gets asked is, what, what happens metabolic, like from a metabolism point of view? And as we age, as we slowly lose muscle mass, it is normal for our metabolism to slow down, which is one of the reasons why weight gain does tend to happen. But this does not mean that you have to just accept the fact that metabolically you are, you know, you, you, you're always going to be, you know, gaining weight for the rest of your life. The one thing I want to point out with that is that first of all, um, metabolism is very intricate. And when we speak about boosting metabolism, there are things that you can do. We can focus on gut health. We can focus on decreasing stress. Um, I actually did a masterclass on this in March, which was specifically about boosting metabolism and mood in midlife. Um, and I've got a, a special offer for everybody at the end of the talk tonight, which I'm giving a flash sale for 24 hours if you want to purchase that at a reduced price. I'll send you an email about that after the call. Um, but metabolically, it does not mean that we cannot still feel good in our body and still manage to reduce the weight that is that we sometimes do end up carrying from a as a result of the hormone changes that we experience in midlife. One of the things that slows metabolism down is eating too little. And one of the reasons that so many women have a problem in their 40s and 50s is when they have gone on very restrictive diets in their 20s and 30s, every time that you've lost weight and gained a little bit of that weight back and lost weight again and gained weight back again, what you've essentially done, and unfortunately, there's nothing we can go back to do to completely change that. I'm, I'm, I'm speaking about this now because I'm warning against doing it in your 40s and 50s because it actually has often the opposite effect. In fact, if we calorie deplete ourselves and exercise too hard, as we've discussed already, it is a stress for the body and it can actually cause weight gain as opposed to the opposite of what we're trying to achieve. So eating too little, not nourishing your body enough, not giving your body a variety of foods, not paying attention to things like inflammation and blood sugar level balance um, is, is doing yourself a disservice. So in I really want to, um, you know, say this is super important. The foods that you choose to eat can have an impact metabolically. It can have an Im impact on inflammation. It can have an impact on hormone balance and control. Um, it can improve your stress. There's so many. It can improve your sleep so and your mood more than anything else. I think that is something that so many women in this age and stage, anxiety, more low mood, more teary and irritable. These are all side effects. These are all symptoms that we experience. And when we eat poorly or we eat too little, it exacerbates those symptoms as well. So there's so much to be said about this. I don't know if you want to have any closing yeah. comments on what I've just said. Yeah, I just want to add one thing to reinforce what you've said. 60% of our brain is fat. And we need fats to support our brain function. Our brain function is being impaired in perimenopause and menopause, brain fog, short-term memory loss, anxiety, mood swings, um, all the emotional upheavals, low energy, low motivation, exhaustion. Our brain function is being impaired in perimenopause and menopause. If we then exacerbate that by going on a low fat diet, reducing our calories and being scared because we're gaining weight of adding more fat to our diet, we are only exacerbating um, the brain function or brain dysfunction because we're not restoring and um, replenishing the fats that our brain needs and even more so that our brain needs to support it extra in this stage of life. So we often get very obsessed and our diet culture has made us very obsessed with this fat how much fat content is there? And we have become very scared of fat. So we want to stay, we traditionally stay away from them. But good, healthy fat is not the same as eating a sugar-coated donut. The sugar-coated donut fat is very different than an avocado fat. Mm. And the calories on each of those foods, a sugar-coated donut and a 
you know, a whole avocado may scare you in terms of the calories in each, but not all calories are created equally and not all fat is created equally. And the and healthy, we need the healthy fats. We need the healthy proteins to really support us in this stage of life to re replenish and nourish what our body is losing or doesn't have or the extra support we need because of all the hormonal fluctuations. Absolutely. Amazing. Well, wow. Jacqueline, I could speak forever and ever. I want to open up the, the microphones and, and uh, let me just check that people can unmute if they want to. Please, if you have any questions, I'd love you to, to, um, to address them to us now to ask Jacqueline any questions. This is an amazing opportunity to get some clarity that if you if you need that, if you have any questions for me, I'd be happy to hear those as well. So if you want to unmute, if you want to turn your cameras on, that will be amazing to see your faces too. <laughs> uh, who's there? I know my mom was on the call. I know this is no longer relevant to her, but I think it's interesting because she is in that postmenopausal. You can't unmute, and I really have allowed you to do that. That's so strange. Ah, oh, we can now. You can. Okay, great. Hello, Tali. Hi. Um, so I wanted to ask: Is it normal for the periods to go all week, all like really weird? As in, let's say you get it one day, and for twenty-four hours, then it goes away for three days, and then it comes back. Like yeah. crazy yeah so the, the one of the one of the myths of of menopause is that your period nicely slowly gets shorter and lighter until it very nicely just stops it's a myth it's absolutely not true your period is going to go all over the place it can get longer it can get heavier the time in between gets shorter gets longer you can go for they say, you know, a bit like a London bus. You can go four months without a period, then two come along at once. So you just don't know. It is very, can be very debilitating, can be very unnerving. And there is so much about much heavier flows. And women get very surprised. Why am I having such a heavy flow? I'm perimenopause. I thought my period's meant to stop. I advise you just to get checked out. Make sure there is no other reason for your irregular bleeding, like for example, you, a uterine or ovarian cysts and fibroids. So I always make sure you go get checked out. But if everything is okay, yes, your periods are going, your menstrual cycle, your bleeding is going to be potentially very, very erratic. Sally, do you wanna just see if you can unmute again now? You should be able to. Yes, I can, thank okay. you so much. Did, did Jacqueline okay. answer your question there? Have you anybody else who's got who's got questions? I'm looking to see Gabrielle. Did did uh, Jacqueline posted in the chat the five pillars? Is there anything that you wanted to ask on any of those in particular? Nothing specific. I just wanted to make sure I caught them all. Um, <laughs> thank you, though. The pleasure. I mean, yeah. Thank you. No, you, if you've got any questions, please feel free to ask. I want to look to see who else is on the call. I know, Aviva, I don't know if you've got any questions. You always have a few questions to ask. I've got a question. Yes. <laughs> it doesn't pertain to me, Jacqueline, but I just want to know if somebody's on um, uh, birth control pills, how does that, does that camouflage the, um, the whole uh, the menopausal situation or? That's an excellent question. Yeah. So being on birth control pills is going to, you will still experience symptoms. The problem is your hormonal, your hormones are not really free to do what they want because they're being regulated by the hormones you are taking in your oral contraceptive. Right. So if you are taking an estrogen only oral contraceptive, your estrogen is going to be more consistent and probably more stable, but you don't, you won't really know where you are in your perimenopause journey. You won't, you will still have symptoms. They may be muted, but your body is basically doing two opposite things. Your body wants to naturally go through the natural hormonal changes and fluctuations, but it's being kept in check 
by the estrogen and or progesterone that you are receiving as part of the oral contraceptive. I want to just say that the hormones you are receiving in your oral contraceptive in the pill are probably synthetic versions of estrogen and or progesterone, which means that they are not direct replicas of the chemical compounds or the chemical combination of your natural hormones. So in this time, I'm not saying to go off the pill, I'm just saying be educated and aware and informed of what is actually going on in your body because the pill is doing one thing to try to regulate while your body is going through, wants to do something else, normal, natural, bio, biological, you potentially may still get, being on the pill does not prevent you from having menopause symptoms, but it keeps the um, hormone levels at a certain level. But just remember, the hormones you are receiving in your oral contraceptive are synthetic hormones and are not similar to your natural biological hormones in your body. Can that cause an estrogen dominant state? Yes or no, it depends what's going on with your estrogen naturally. Okay. Um, and it is a bit difficult to say because the synthetic estrogen will have a different body response. It has a different physiological response in your body. So you may be having your regular natural estrogen that is fluctuating and the synthetic estrogen that is, that the, is feeding the body as if you are having estrogen and um, potentially um, you may actually, your system, your symptoms may be exacerbated. It, it, it's very, very personalized. Yeah, it's complicated that. Mm -hmm. um, maybe you can speak to, I know we haven't got onto it, and just maybe this last thing, if, unless there's anybody else who specifically has a question to, that they want to ask. Rachel, yes. Hey, wait, can you hear me? Yes, it's a little bit soft, so if you can just speak as close okay. to the mic as possible. Okay, I'll try to talk. Um, I, I don't know how much you can answer this or not. I am been I was perimenopause for 10 years and now I am menopause for five years. At what point does this stop? <laughs> Do we get back to any kind of normalcy anymore? Because for now 17 years, I have been a mess <laughs> and it's not a lot of fun. Um, so firstly, um, I really understand your pain and struggle. Secondly, I'd like to know the difference between what you are defining as perimenopause and what you are defining as menopause. Um, where did you get those definitions from? But really, the minute you hit menopause, 12 period, three months, in theory, the symptoms eventually should disappear and should calm down. As your FSH level rises, which is the marker of uh, the blood marker that we want to see that will help us um, also biologically define you as being in menopause. If you have um, allowed your hormones to really um, get themselves to a place where they are less supportive, new, low maintenance levels, then your symptoms will eventually stop. The problem is, is that even in menopause or postmenopause, if your hormones are close to zero, if your hormones are in the tank and you are not doing yet anything about it to support the hormones, your symptoms will persist. So it's not a magic thing. Oh, now I'm in menopause. My periods have stopped. I'm going to feel amazing. You will eventually feel amazing, but many women can persist to have symptoms well into postmenopause because they are not getting the hormonal support or they're not implementing the strategies to support their hormones and their hormones are not at the maintenance level. They are at zero. Plus there is a lot going on with our spiritual journey through perimenopause and menopause, really um, embracing this new you, what is happening with all of that. Um, so I'd like to have, not now, but a little bit more information from you of what was perimenopause for you? What is menopause for you? How, do you? how are you defining those things? And what strategies are you implementing to really help support your hormones so that you're, you, can hit, you can fix your symptoms? Right. I'll put your contact information in the, in an email that that goes out because I think there's a lot of a lot of questions. Um, I know you do offer um, a fr a free um, 
discovery yeah, I have a, a free discovery call a 90 minute menopause consultation and a 10 week own your menopause program so there's there's lots of different ways I think to still be in touch with Jacqueline and to get a lot of these questions answered as I said we could speak for forever I know there was another comment that came up in the chat now hormonal support yeah. um what is home, hormonal support I think you just seem we're going to have to spend another hour and a half another on hour. Uh, we'd love um, to answer we'd yeah. love to answer that question Naomi but I, I will just answer it in one sentence hormonal support is creating hormonal balance whether it is externally through a hormonal therapy or lifestyle changes or um, supplementation support or all the things that I've been talking about this evening, my five pillars of really looking at what is going on in each of those areas, supporting our hormones so that they are more balanced, so that we have more um, resilience in our bodies to allow us to really function in the best way that we can without these symptoms keeping us from really feeling amazing. Jacqueline, thank you so much. And thank you to all the ladies that have stayed on the call and everybody who, who was on the live stream. For those people who have not been able to make it live, I will be sending this recording out. Thank you, Jacqueline, for reminding me to record. <laughs> that is something else that I'd, I have a, a bad habit of, of forgetting. Um, and really, just I appreciate the time that you've spent. I admire the work that you do. I think we're both very much in alignment with the messaging that, we, that we're putting out there. And uh, we both are very find it incredibly important that women are empowered and understand what it is that they can do in order to take charge of their of their health of the years of perimenopause and menopause you do not need to struggle or battle your way through it i said in a in a recent post it's important that we have this information because whether we like it or not our body is going to take us kicking and screaming through it so rather understand it rather have the information and uh, be proactive. So yeah. thank you, Jacqueline. Well, thank you so much for letting me be part of this conversation. And um, I'm excited for our next collaboration together, which I know is going to happen at some point. Absolutely, absolutely. Right. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. I'm going to stop the live stream on Facebook and I'm going to say good night to everybody. Thank you for joining. Thank you.